know, uh, in the organization, uh, taking the decisions for us employees. So, um, so I will, uh, uh, you know, quickly introduce them. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to let all of you know that uh, we are also live on Facebook. So in case you are somehow uh, out of Zoom and not able to get in, then you can go to our Beyond Diversity Facebook live page and you can watch us there. Uh, also, uh, I will be moderating this session. Uh, and I please put in your questions uh, on the chat box and I will be taking your questions and putting it on to the, to the speakers. So my name is Rashmi Mandloi and uh, I lead uh, uh, the diversity practice for Beyond Diversity. Uh, and it gives me a great pleasure to introduce both Subhankar and Rajesh onto the session today. A little bit of introduction uh, for both of them. First, uh, is uh, Subhankar. He is the HR um, uh, director for Lenovo in Asia Pacific and Japan and is responsible for the developing the people agenda aligned to the business for Asia Pacific and Japan. Uh, before joining Lenovo, Subankar has held a, a number of position, uh, positions in HR consulting in HR generous stores in Nokia, IBM business consulting, PwC, uh, and not just in India, but in outside of India as well. Uh, he holds a master's degree in management and a bachelor's degree, uh, degree in economics. And um, he is an exemplary speaker and a panelist and contributor to contemporary HR topics such as future of work. So, and I think that's a very important topic to uh, be, you know, sort of uh, talking about today, uh, especially in this, in this uh, world where we are right now moving into almost spearheading to this entire uh, uh, future, uh, future way of working. Our next guest is uh, uh, Rajesh Ramakrishnan. He is the CEO MD for Perfetti Van Mill and is a veteran with 25 years of experience uh, in management and sales and marketing. Uh, um, he has, has been an accomplished business leader and has worked in uh, organizations like PepsiCo, Marico, uh, and Rekid Beckin Zeitzer. He is um, just, uh, you know, he, apart from this, which is not mentioned in his CV, he's a, a great photographer and he's an avid mountaineer, um, you know, uh, having completed Everest Space Camp, Kilimanjaro, and last year, I think the Annapurna Base Camp. So he's a graduate in engineering from Bits Pilani and an MBA from XLRI Jumshedpur. So a uh, welcome to both my esteemed guests, Rajesh and Subhankar. Um, before, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually, you know, sort of, put this question to you all. Uh, I want to see how many people have joined in. Yeah, so people are still joining in. And um, uh, I also wanted to give you a little background about, uh, about our uh, Beyond Diversity. So we are actually, um, you know, we work in the space of diversity and inclusion, and we believe in building better inclusive spaces. So we have, you know, sort of impacted 100 plus organizations and almost a lack of individuals. Um, this is what we do. We do DNI consulting. We do social impact advisory. We do research. We do leadership development. Uh, we are very well known for our mentoring programs. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you what we have just launched in the COVID-19 uh, times as well and how we've got some great response. I'll tell you in the end about it. And we do a lot of advocacy uh, uh, in building positive linkages between business and communities. So that's what we do. So over to today in understanding what is happening, um, you know, uh, with the COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, lockdown happening. Most of the government and most of the state governments have actually, you know, sort of, uh, I, I know Bangalore has started working. Most of the countries like Hong Kong, uh, Vietnam, etc., have also started working and India will soon start doing that. So we have uh, Rajesh and Subhankar you know, telling us what is the decision happening behind uh, coming out of the uh, lockdown and how is the world, the official work world going to look like post COVID lockdown. So uh, my first question to both of you, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, Rajesh and Subhankar is, uh, what was your first reaction to this COVID lockdown? Uh, for me, I would know that, you know, uh, I thought that it, this will go on for maximum two, three weeks and it will come out. But right now we see that, you know, coming out, of course, is there, but this is like a long haul. So what was your first reaction? Uh, Subhankar, you go first. Okay, thank you, Rashmi, for the opportunity and thanks uh, visitors and guests. 
pleasure to speak to you this is my first experience on the live platform so i also have to be very careful what i say given that we are in a digital world today i also noticed the uh, introduction you had and i it was a picture of mine for the maybe 5 to 10 years back so i hope the guests are able to recognize me because i look so different right now you look the same you look the same <laughs> all right so thanks for that so you know the whole process of pandemic we didn't ever knew it was a pandemic and this started maybe i remember we were on a trip in sri lanka in the late january which is where we started hearing about in wuhan that we are having some of the concerns of a new virus spreading till such time that for there was no information whatsoever coming in uh, i in my role if i have to like to give a quick introduction i look after the human resources for asia pacific as a region and that includes from japan to india so the impacted countries in the first wave was hong kong and south korea to some extent because we did have a lot of influx of travelers from china to some other parts of asia pacific but then it started slowing down and we never realized the impact of what it would mean for many of the markets i think personally also uh, if i have to look back right now we were never prepared for this what it has turned out to be as a pandemic right now so the initial reaction was ignorance the initial reaction was this happens in other countries and not to us but over a period of time when it just exploded and reality hits us then we re we realize how unprepared we are on many areas which i think we will talk more about what those areas are so that was how the whole thing that evolved from late january to today okay um rajesh what was your first reaction to this covid lockdown yeah uh, good evening everybody thanks rashmi for having me on this uh, session and uh, pleasure to be here as always with uh, bd um yeah like uh, shubhankar said actually interestingly i was in uh, singapore actually on the way back from phuket in uh, on the 23rd of jan and uh, pretty much uh, that was when i heard about the wuhan thing uh, sitting with some friends in singapore and uh, they were like and i remember that person was saying that oh my god this is happening now i need to rush out and buy masks for myself uh because i'm sure it's going to run out very soon because they used to live in china before and somehow i guess they had a little bit of a sense of what was uh, what was coming and uh, i of course got out of singapore the next day uh, from a literally empty changi airport there was nobody there in the airport of course it was chinese new years as well but um, it was just empty and uh, even when you came back to india and pretty much through february and even i would say till the middle of march right as you saw what was happening around the world in uh, largely in um, in parts of asia pack initially and then europe in a very very big way uh, italy spain and so on and so forth uh, i think like shubhankar was saying it was like okay it's happening somewhere uh, it's not going to come uh, here very quickly and maybe not in that magnitude so there was a little bit of a concern and uh, caution in our minds but uh, nothing uh, which you know which told us what's the way it's going to uh, come uh, come here and while we did uh, declare work from home probably slightly before uh, prime minister modi announced his um, uh, first round of lockdown uh, even then the thought from many of us in the office was of course that yeah we're going to be in a bit of a lockdown for a while and we'll probably be soon getting back to some sort of uh, you know a, a, a normal so i think initially that was the kind of response that many people had and then of course over the course of lockdown 1 2 and then 3 uh the severity of the issue of course worldwide has been uh, well known and in some countries it's been really bad india i think is still in the in the i would say the middle uh, stage of how things are going to pan out because as things open up is when we'll get a sense of how it will really uh, be uh, so yeah i guess that's the kind of uh, initial response that was there okay so now since we are already talking about and yesterday the you know the uh, yesterday day before yesterday the entire uh, fiscal stimulus was also announced and of course there is this entire uh, government is wanting all the industries to open up so post lockdown now since both of you are um, uh, you know cxos post lockdown and when physical work spaces actually open up what would be your priority subankar i would like you to go first on this from an organizational perspective what would be your priority especially from hr as well so there are a couple of things and it is something that we have been preparing for for a quite number of weeks now 
it started with during the lockdown, how do you keep all employees safe and healthy? That's mm -hmm. really the first and important. When I talk about healthy, it is both physical health and also psychological and mental health. I think that's been the primary function throughout the periods that we have seen when people are working from home. As people we plan to start back to come to the office, there are a couple of things that become important. So number one is ensuring, again, the health and safety. And not only that, ensuring that we follow what the government health authorities guidelines and protocols are. Secondly, we do have a very, very strong governance around our global health and safety procedures that we have to follow. And that cut, cuts across how you travel, how you sanitize the office, how you create a safe distance, how you do a temperature check, what percent of the people can huddle together, how do you really come in shifts in a manufacturing unit, in a process industry, and many, many, many more. Ensuring that you, ensuring that we focus on the health and the safety of the employees is really very important and doing all these things. I think the second thing was on the business side. How can you get the business up and running and back on the feet? We have been starving because in our industry, we sell laptops, mobile phones, server, desktops, and IT solutions. During this period, we have a huge demand of people wanting supply, but we haven't been able to supply our products and services. So how do you really ensure we get your supply chain back in, you get your demand fulfillment back in, and then how do you reach your, get your services across the customer? Thirdly, talking about services, again, we have been one of the pioneering companies which have decided to give some of the basic services to irrespective of what brand you follow, whether you are a competitive brand or whether you're a Lenovo brand. During the COVID period, we have in some countries, including India, tried to help uh, customers use laptops into the breakdown. So that's on the business side. And the third thing, of course, ensuring that how do you prepare for crisis? We do not know COVID-19 is the last COVID or not. It could be a COVID-20. What this has taught us is very importantly, how do you anticipate crisis, manage crisis and respond to crisis? Because this probably is not going to be probably the last one we could expect similar pandemic coming in the future. Oh, yeah. If we have another pandemic coming in like this, then, you know, I think <laughs> the world is definitely going to change. Rajesh, your views on uh, opening up. Yeah, I think pretty much uh, Shubhanka touched upon a lot of the points. Um, I, I think like he mentioned, to, to us, the first priority is safety, right? Safety of employees, right? From a physical safety point of view that, you know, when you get back to office, uh, one, the office itself, because that's a uh, enclosed space where there are people going to come in from different parts of the uh, city, at least. Uh, and therefore, how do we ensure safety and uh, that during the you know working hours? And the second is people are going to be traveling and coming from um, you know different places. Uh, so how do they navigate through that? And therefore, uh, how do we maintain the safety? I think if you take it one level, then of course comes the, the mental safety and the emotional safety which in a way is directly linked to the morale of the people, right? Because at a lot of, uh, in a lot of levels, there are various questions that people have in terms of uh, what this means to me, what happens to work, um, what happens, what's going to happen in the future and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of questions that are, uh, you know, in people's mind and how are we able to address that and keep the morale and motivation up for people. And in a way, the link to that, the third piece I would say is the productivity, right? Because if I am at a uh, um, certain level of physical, mental, and emotional uh, stability, it directly again reflects on my productivity in terms of how I, how I am able to contribute back to the business. So I think we need to address it in, in these stages. And for us as a consumer products company, I would also separate the, you know, the physical spaces into our factories, our um, sales organization, and our offices, right? So factories, of course, uh, all our factories were shut. We have three factories in the country. But over the course of the last uh, six months, packaged foods and uh, beverages were um, uh, allowed to be uh, opened. And over time, we have slowly opened up our uh, factories, not uh, to our full capacity yet. But uh, that has been a, that's been a good progress uh, for ourselves. Also, which signs optically the right message for the, for the people in the organization that we are 
uh, getting back in business, right? And I think, uh, like Subankar mentioned, that's an important thing for people to realize that yes, we are uh, back in business. Uh, of course, the good part is because we are a foods company, there is the highest level of uh, safety and hygiene uh, taken care in the factory, and therefore uh, uh, we can be you know fairly confident that the factories are. Uh, very safe in terms of uh, just making sure that we provide the right environment. Uh, the most difficult ones are for our sales colleagues because they go to the market and they take orders shop to shop and they sell in uh, you know the small mom and pop stores. So there again, we have been very, very clear that the first priority is safety and only then we start uh, looking at other things. So again, we are using a little bit of the, the green, orange and the red zone uh, concept to say that in green zones where relatively it's better, the sales guys can go into the market if they are still able to uh, manage to do that. Orange, be a little bit more cautious. Red, probably stay at home at least for the time being. So that's as far as the market is concerned. And offices, uh, I think the interesting part is, and I, I can touch upon it a little later when we talk about it, um, there have been many paradigms which have got shattered, right? I mean, a lot of us thought that, oh my God, work from home, how do we even do that? What happens, etc. But we've actually been doing it for not just a few days, but for for many weeks now, right? So, uh, and work is absolutely going on uh, the way it should. Uh, so there has been no problems whatsoever. Of course, there's a bit of a fatigue that sets in and so on and so forth. But uh, we really clearly realize that uh, work from home is working very well for at least the office colleagues. And that's something that we probably intend to continue for May for sure. And then uh, we'll see how things open up. What does lockdown for uh, point to look like and then decide how to um, uh, open up uh, offices as well. So a great amount of workforce planning which is happening uh, con uh, considering the you know type of worker which is required I mean uh, office and your uh, you know manufacturing places. So Subankar I know I mean uh, the hardware industry is in a boom right now I mean you would be needing to do more business than you you know you you know in the past were required to because now everybody everything is getting onto uh, the digital world so is there a you know and with this entire uh, government restrictions on 33 percent of work getting onto the workspace what is your i mean how do you plan to manage and this is india i would also want you to give some examples because you're managing asia pacific i know hong kong and vietnam markets have opened up so what are the best practices that you can share, share with us here so just to understand your question better, best practices in terms of? In terms of, uh, you know, getting out of this lockdown and how people are getting back to work, uh, be it virtually or be it in office, uh, anything that you can share. I think the first thing to your, um, you, you just mentioned about our industry. So yes, we do not, honestly, we do not know where this is going to land up in terms of our industry's uh, uh, current growth or degrowth, because there are two parts to it. There's of course a lot of pent up demand because people are not able to buy a mobile phone or a laptop or a desktop. But the other hand, if there are some industries which have not seen better days, as an example, aviation, as an example, tourism, hospitality, these are the industries which have been impacted the most. And so if I look at our business, we have got a consumer business and we have a commercial business. Consumer business is where we sell to end consumers like us and the commercial business where we send to large corporates. And the large corporates would depend on what kind of you know, impact COVID has on those industries. So that's just going to qualify. So we are, we've got visibility and line of sight for the next quarter, but beyond that, I think we would have to see where the dust settles down. As far as some fundamental shifts that we see, uh, firstly, I would like to say that Lenovo has always been a work from home company. And I must share a little bit of myself as a person. I have been uh, fortunate to have worked with two organizations, my previous one and now, where work from home has been pretty much common. Uh, my remit is Asia Pacific, but I either travel I, or I spend most of the time working remotely from my home, which is where I'm right now. So the life hasn't really changed a lot for me. But what I see interesting is the life has also changed a lot for others who now work like I do, have always been working. So three, four things that I see from our industry's perspective, which I'm thinking aloud, what could be the new, as I call as the new normal. Firstly, in markets where work from home has never been a very, very strong practice, would, be, would that be a more semi-permanent nature? I'm not saying that we go from zero degrees to 180 degrees. I'm not saying that you can leave manufacturing, you can leave process industries, 
you can leave research and development. People need to be in those locations because they need the equipment to work. But a lot of other functions, which are backend functions, which are non-customer functions, we have to make some judicious choice that things can work be done remotely. What does that mean working remotely mean? Number one, I think studies are still very limited, but productivity, as you mentioned, Reshmi, has actually gone up, which is a fascinating piece of uh, you know, information, which is coming in very, very recently. Globally, many companies are reporting higher productivity. Secondly, I, somebody reported out uh, Japan, which is one of our biggest markets, has, has seen the lowest suicide date rates in the last five years. So it's amazing that a country which had a higher suicide rates in the last three months has seen the least suicides happen compared to a five year period, which is remarkable. In India, we have a, you know, artificial intelligence based tool that measures employee happiness at periodic levels. We have seen through the data, real time data, that for the last two months, the happiness index has gone up. So a lot of people write up about having the people are feeling frustrated. Yes, there is. You can't go home, go and can't go to the office. But on the other hand, I think there are some real positives that we are seeing. Now, also on the other hand, we will see, we have to start thinking about if we have more semi-permanent options of working remotely, how can we equip employees with better ergonomics sitting at home? better infrastructure, like a monitor, like a better security at home, a better chair. I mean, these are more important education and well-being initiatives, which we do in office. We have to transport back in a remote location. Also, there are some really interesting opportunities coming up. Where will you work out of? We have always seen rural to urban migration. Can work go back to smaller towns and cities? Would be very interesting to see over a period of time. And lastly, what I think may happen is greater focus on e-health. What does that e-health mean? Today we have introduced in Lenovo with the help of our benefits team, employees taking support of doctors remotely for different ailments. I have personally used it for smaller and minor ailment, of course, without going to the hospital. So over a period of time, can we offer health services, well-being services, engagement services in a virtual world. These are some of the things which I think would be new normal, which will still very pilot, but I think really good food for thought in the future. Uh, great. So uh, Salim Ahmed, can you please uh, not share your screen, please? Salim Ahmed? Uh, So um, uh, I just want to share this particular uh, slide with uh, both of you, Shubhankar and uh, Rajesh. Uh, this actually, I actually was attending one of, uh, you know, one of uh, um, webinars yesterday. And this is uh, from the Josh uh, Bursin Institute and he writes a lot on culture. So he was doing some research and he says the top issues currently on employee minds um, and uh, is on job security then on personal health, then of course on child uh, uh, care and homeschooling and personal finances and it's, it's, it's all there. So the top thing on people's mind right now is on job security. So um, I know that the difference, the industries are different right now and uh, there are you know, various industries uh, who are cutting jobs, uh, be it aviation or be it um, you know, hospitality. Uh, so can, can you just tell us a decision? In fact, Rajesh, in, in fact, you can just say what could, what could be possibly be um, the reasons why you know people might be losing jobs are they not skilled enough or uh, what is happening or the organizations are losing out on they don't have the money uh, yeah i mean if, if i look at it in a at a very generic level i think uh, you know uh, it the the covid has impacted different companies and different industries differently right so uh, like you mentioned if you look at aviation or if you look at hospitality Pretty much these industries, which are quite highly, um, you know, labor intensive and capital intensive, have come to a virtual standstill over the last uh, couple of months, right? So obviously they have a huge set of challenges in terms of how do, 
one we don't know how and when they'll start reviving and if they do to what extent right so both are a little bit of a i would say a question mark so i i guess for industries low, like those their their the set of challenges is greater because uh, it it is really a function of how fast they are able to rebound and how much are they able to rebound whereas if i were to talk about a little bit of uh, say consumer product companies where i guess the elasticity of demand is relatively better say say companies like us i mean we 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 sell products which are largely in the 1 rupee um, you know space and at best we go to 5 rupee and 10 rupee and maybe in some cases a little beyond that so here once you see people starting to come out into the streets and people the you know the traffic starting to happen on the streets you will find uh, you know people will start uh, going back to consuming uh, chewing gum and confectionery products so um, so a lot of it i think is also a function of the industry you operate in uh, the price point you operate in the nature of the category you operate in how discretionary is it and uh, not so i i guess um, there is no one uh, you know straight answer to that question but it really would depend on um, a few of those uh, factors okay so i just want to guys since people are all on this call uh, i would want you all to take this first poll which says what is the biggest fear that we have post lockdown and there are four options if you all can just take this then it will also help us you know sort of have a, a good engaging conversation around it so can you all see please please do uh, sort of uh, take this poll and let us also know uh, what is the biggest fear that we have post lockdown can you all see my screen yes we can yeah okay i'll end polling right now so the last bar is not very visible it's at least in my screen making myself useful oh, sorry, to sorry, sorry. Sorry. it's just the number that's not visible right the bar how many bars are there three bars nine, or four bars 9% 9% there are four uh, four bars uh, yeah the fourth bar it's not visible but yeah the percentage is there so i'm just closing the polling right now so if you look at it the biggest fear that we have post lockdown most of the people are saying safety of workplace and i think uh, that's what both of you also echoed saying you know safe workplaces is what everybody is worried about and i think uh, both as a chro and as a ceo you both are you know taking uh, care of that uh, of course managing work life with covid is the second biggest fear that most of the people have so subankar do you want to take this as to how can we manage work life with covid around so before i go there i just want to comment on george bursian's data and this data that's come out is very interesting yeah i was going to ask you on the george bursian data what's what's really the geographic spread of participants so that was more that was more around the us yeah the us and the europe uh, which is why i i guess so because yeah, you know I, the job security yeah. has come out yeah that's why i wanted to also take this poll and uh, you know sort of uh, you know sort of collaborated together yeah so this is what the results are uh So when you look at managing work life with COVID, you know there are just like we have in history before crisis and after crisis. You know similarly now life has become before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. And hope this is the only COVID we have. Having said that, the managing work life. Firstly, I think it would uh, be very important that we are either asking employees to work from home in all markets in Asia Pacific, or we are asking them to come to office in a very limited. capacity uh, only and unless they need to we are starting with a 33% in most of the markets just to ensure that we are not rushing the you know the employees and asking them to come so uh, if people were to continue to work from home as they are doing what does it mean for them in terms of their remote working what does that mean for them in terms of their connectivity what does it mean for them having a safe secure place for them to work Uh, there are countries where we may not have the luxury of having isolated workplaces at home there might be multiple family members in a very small house in a metro city so not everybody is fortunate to have a quite a workplace so for those there are imp- it's important for them to also we have to remember that it is not one size that fits all 
working from home also definitely means there are a couple of other things that we need to take care of, uh, whether it is using the virtual collaborative platforms, which has almost become the norm. The amount of team and the Zoom meetings that have, we have been using is phenomenal. And that's really a new normal for us, how we have been doing meetings. An extension for that would be customer meetings. It is okay to have expectation setting with your own colleagues that, hey, I would going to meet you in Microsoft Team or a Zoom. But what about customer meetings? What about large scale events? And Rajesh would also say that there are so many customer, supplier, distributor meets that have happened, which are more face-to-face, -face, socializing, building relationships. Can those move to a virtual world? Will they be happy? Will Can we have the same level of effectiveness as we move external meetings also in a virtual world? I think the other important thing is how do you measure productivity? And I, again, I've been blessed and lucky to be with technology organizations where there's no punch in, where there are there's no punch out. However, I have known employees who come for interviews and there's nothing wrong with that, who have a very, very strong attendance system where if you are late three consecutive days, you may be marked as an absent. So what about those organizations which have had so strong you know, systems and processes of attendance. Even public sector companies, I was just reading an interview of a CHRO of a public sector company who said that the entire attendance system was a start point of a, you know, payroll process of an employee. How do you really ensure that those processes are redesigned to ensure that there is continuity? So there are these many things that would happen based on the industry we operate in, the processes we have been running, whether it's a manufacturing, whether it is a back office, whether it's a sales function. But what I really believe in is every organization is finding its own path, how to navigate and mitigate this. There's no one size uh, for all, but everybody's finding the right balance to move forward without disrupting the business. Sure. So Rajesh, what I mean, uh, Subhankar gave a lot of uh, great points, but I also feel that capability building of uh, and you know future skills is required. So would you want to talk something about that in terms of what kind of skill set is required to you know sort of manage work life with COVID right now? Yeah, I mean, if you look at skill set, I think they, you know or competencies as we call it, there are two parts to it, right? One is your functional competencies, and the other is your behavioral competencies, right? Uh, to me, if I look at it, uh, the functional competencies will get sharpened uh, through some of when we go through some of these things, because, you know, one, uh, like Shubankar mentioned, you're working remotely. Second, you're trying to sort of coordinate with multiple people in different places and so on and so forth. So you need to be on top of your game. And that's a sharpening that, uh, you know, takes place as a natural process. But to me, the more important part is the behavioral competencies, because when you are, you know, talking a meeting on Zoom, or teams or wherever, and when you are dealing with people from across the world in different uh, locations and so on, how am I able to adjust myself? How am I able to adapt myself? How am I able to collaborate better? How do I listen better, right? So those are some of the other skills and competencies that one needs to dial up on in order to be uh, effective on one level and more efficient in what we do. Sure. So. Um... Uh, so again, this question I'm posing to both of you, everyone seems to be talking about innovating, you know, moving out from the new novel, be creative. Uh, so as an individual, how do I become creative? How do I become innovative? Any answers to that? So I do not know uh, when you, uh, Rashmi, when you talk about creativity or innovation, uh, innovation or creativity leads to um, something that you're trying to achieve here uh, to you know get out of the COVID in a be stronger and more successful. So just to frame the question a little more, what would you say would be the context of creativity and innovation here? Yeah. So thank you for you know sort of uh, you know qualifying that. Yeah. So because there's a lot of uh, uh, you know sort of uh, studies and people are coming saying that you know you need to have newer ways of looking at things. You have to have newer skill sets to you know sort of be more relevant in the post-COVID world. Uh, and um, you need to be doing things differently. Whatever worked for you in the past might not work for you in the future. So yeah. you have to innovate. So how do I innovate? Yeah. 
So I can talk about my function, which is HR function. And HR is a function where we are very fortunate to have a great support of the business leaders. So one innovation is, you know, the president of Asia Pacific, uh, my manager, he uh, works out of Hong Kong. And he is a fitness uh, enthusiast. So he does a lot of workout every week. So he had this brain wave that he would live stream fitness exercises from Hong Kong three times a week and mobilize through Zoom 500 to 1,000 employees. And this continued for two months. So from a Hong Kong fitness studio and every session at seven o'clock or eight o'clock, whatever the time was, we had one leadership member from Hong Kong leading that. It did some really fantastic wonders which we did not even experience in a normal situation. Number one, it got a lot of people out of the bed to start exercising because there was a lot of, you know, uh, you know, seeing others do it, you feel like doing it. Number two, in the last two, three months, I would have met so many people in person like this that I would not have met them over a long period of time because most of the time it would have been either Skype chat or a phone call or physical travel to that location. So the people to people connect, interestingly enough, has increased rather than decreased. Uh, so the one of the innovation is of course the fitness. The second innovation of course is how do you cater to the health of employees? So as I already shared with you that there are, there are India and many other parts of the world is becoming very entrepreneurial. The moment COVID happened, there is a lot of e-health services which came knocking at our doors. So one of the service providers we have partnered with for the last two years also offered her offered us or stepped up the offer of offering doctor services by app and on the phone call. So this is another example of innovation where you do not have to step out, but you are able to support employees' health and medical services sitting at home by giving that virtual service. Number three, we do a lot of program on CSR and employee volunteering. Sitting at home, we could help some of the NGOs to do geotagging for some of the relief activities by helping the geotagging. You are giving time rather than being on the field. So you see, there are these three examples where you do not have to leave home, but yet you're able to offer a virtual, but very meaningful, effective experience to your employees and you know, still do what you're looking for to achieve. So basically go into your own um, deeper networks and think a little more differently, giving the same services, but how could you sort of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, do it more differently. I mean, that is, that is how from a nature perspective. Rajesh, do you have any uh, ideas around innovation since you are a photographer, you're an avid mountaineer? Well, yeah, some of those, unfortunately, I'm not able to do right now. And <laughs> no matter any innovation, I don't think I'm going to go to the Himalayas very soon. Uh, but, you know, uh, just to add to a couple of points that Shubhakar mentioned, I think, you know, if, what is innovation? And innovation, you know, typically in some of our companies, we tend to look at it as, you know, creating new products or new services. I think it, it goes beyond that. It, it, it is really about saying, okay, under the circumstances, what can I do differently to do things better, right? And in a way, it is linked to the typical Indian thing of uh, Jugaad, right? I'm able to... Uh, you know, continuously improvise and do stuff uh, in a manner which gives a better output uh, with the same or uh, less number of inputs. So one of the things, at least I think the COVID has taught us is how can I optimize on my resources, right? Now, whether it is, the, so obviously as a company, if I have to run a company, the minute my sales drops, I have to optimize on my other costs to make sure that I'm able to sort of try and maintain my, you know, p &L. So therefore, if you really look at it, Money has become a is become tighter in the current circumstances. Interestingly, space has become less because we are all used to roaming around freely wherever we wanted to, and suddenly we find ourselves either constrained by our homes or in whatever locations we are. So space has become a bit of a challenge. Travel is something that we can't do. So how do I optimize my resources? and yet find ways of delivering what I need to deliver, right? So innovation comes in there as well to figure out those solutions. If you look at another level, I think everybody from large organizations to business entrepreneurs have a business model in which they work with, right? So they have created a business model. Now, suddenly you find, thanks to COVID, 
that business model has gone out of the window. Now, I know of a friend who recently took up a large space and created this beautiful looking gym, right? Fitness center, spent a lot of money on it, got everything in place. And now suddenly you find that, what do I do with that space, right? So because, you know, everything is stopped and otherwise people are doing it online. So I think this whole thing of how am I able to tweak my business model to make sure that I'm still able to leverage the business model for something else is again becoming important. So for example, a good example is uh, how, uh, you know, companies like Swiggy and Zomato have a network of people going, you know, from one place to another, how those are being leveraged now for delivering groceries and delivering other things. Originally, the thought was to deliver food, but these are now being used for delivering other stuff, right? So that to me, that's innovation in the business model. Yeah. yeah. Or the third part is innovating in, uh, again, Shubankar touched upon it. How do I forge different and new kinds of partnerships? Because suddenly what you find is that, like they say, an enemy of your enemy is your friend. But suddenly if you find there is a common enemy going around, how can I find new partnerships? How can I find new people who I can collaborate with? Because when suddenly in a different context, when I put two things together, I can find something which can be a win-win for both parties. Right. And last but not the least, I think again is about leveraging technology for innovation. I mean, who would have thought you could play Tambola on Zoom or attend a wedding on Zoom, right? So there are many things that which we never thought was possible, which are now happening on Zoom. So I, I, I'm just giving Zoom as an example. But how do I leverage technology going forward for doing things which otherwise took physical uh, connections and physical uh, movement uh, for it to happen? And in a way, think about it. Actually, by doing all of that, you are being a little bit easy on uh, Mother Earth as well, because you are, in a way, you know, respecting the planet and taking care of the environment. And we, I mean, the, the blue skies, the clean air, and listening to the birds chirping is testimony to that. So innovation is really about saying, in the different things that we do on a daily basis, can I bring about a change in mindset and a change in thinking to get pretty much similar output for lesser input? So you're talking about a thriving mindset rather than a survival mindset, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I believe absolutely. you have sort of penned down certain normal. Uh, would you want to share it with us, Ajesh? I mean, you were talking about it yesterday. Your normal. Well, I, I could, and I, I actually spoke about quite a bit of it uh, uh, now. But uh, you know, to me, if if I look at it, uh, I don't know if you can see the screen. Yes. Um, can you uh, make it into? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying presentation to get here. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I was just trying to define for myself what the new normal is. And if I were to just use that as an abbreviation, uh, to me, the first thing is about really nurturing relationships. And, you know, the interesting part, again, Shubhakar spoke about it. So every day I connect with 10 people in the organization just to get a sense check of how people are doing, what are they, you know, how their family is doing, how is their work going on and so forth. And one of the common threads that I pick up from pretty much everybody is that they have started connecting with people they never connected with over many, many years, right? I mean, it really took a uh, virus to make us connect with our school friends and college friends. And that's a common theme that I'm, you know, I've, I found. So one of the things is about even going forward, how do we continue to nurture some of these relationships and continue to have that as part of our, uh, you know, uh, regular life? The second bit I really spoke about it, which is optimizing of existing resource. And, you know, we were discussing mountaineering. And one of the things that insights for me was when you're up in the mountain, whether you're going to Kilimanjaro or Everest Base Camp, you actually realize that you can do with so little things, right? You don't need a lot actually to get by. You just need a good, clean bed to sleep in and good, wholesome, healthy food to eat. And that's pretty much what you need. So one of the things is, even as we go forward, in terms of just our day-to-day -day life, is there opportunities to optimize our resources so that we can make the resource last for a much longer time and thereby, again, uh, go easy on the planet, which is really the third point on how do we respect our planet? Can work from home for a few days become a new normal? For example, do we really need to travel so many times to so many locations? Can some of those get converted into virtual meetings, right? So how do we respect our planet more? The fourth is about making use of opportunities, right? And really saying, can I start, you know, creating new things? Can I start forming new collaborations? I mean, the number of people who talk about 
oh, I discovered an old passion. I used to paint before, I used to sing before, and now I've got time and I've discovered that. Or there are other people who are discovering new passions, right? Because they have some time in their hand. And again, that's something that in our regular day-to-day -day life, we end up missing out on. And this is a good opportunity to bring that back as a new normal. The fourth one, or the fifth one is around adaptability. And I spoke about it, which is really about saying, today, I mean, we were, I saw the ad recently, which has been made by 15 people sitting in different locations. I mean, could you even imagine creating an advertisement, a television commercial, where people don't come together and do it, and they're doing it remotely, right? So, which is really to say, can there be business models which are, again, getting reinvented? Can I form those partnerships where I don't need to really, uh, you know, uh, come in um, physical uh, contact to uh, connect up and so on and so forth. So, again, being much more agile and adaptable. And last but not the least, uh, which is the L, which is really about leveraging technology a lot more. And again, we spoke about it to make uh, our lives much more effective and efficient without really losing the human touch. So how can we do this? And if you're able to do this new normal, who knows, structurally, we might come towards a space where we truly have a better tomorrow. Great. Um, thank you, Rajesh. I mean, and this was really nice. I mean, you and you've explained it so well uh, with the with the entire thing on, you know, normal. Uh, Subhankar, uh, would you want to, you know, sort of say something? No, I think, no, Rashmi, I think uh, we have got 10 minutes. I would rather, we should take some questions and it will be good to interact with the, with the audience. With the audience. Okay, great. So, um, so we have the first question from Anuradha Singh. She says, what changes would be needed at the office infrastructure, which is currently designed on open, designed on open concept? Uh, then uh, Himanshu Nirbhai is saying, since work from home success in last nearly two months has clearly indicated cost saving for the organization, will more and more organizations plan for work from home for 50 to 70% of the workforce? Can we take this first question and then we can go to the other question as well? So, yeah, you want me to I'm happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, pretty quickly uh, on the two. Work. Firstly, I think open offices is going to be there, but it's going to stay. But what's going to change over a period of time, which is one is immediate and more is long term. On the immediate basis, from a safety reason, we are planning to have safe distances. So, in many offices, you are shutting down one desk, as an example, next to the other desk. So, you know, you keep one desk out completely. So that's how some of the arrangements are being laid out as we get into the office. I already spoke about the capacity being reduced to 30 to 50% at the beginning. Our meeting room capacity has been reduced to half. Cafeteria has been moved into staggered timings. Uh, in manufacturing, as much as possible, moving into shifts. I think these are some of the new normals or new you know, safety measures we're putting in place. Th temperature checks for every employee, either self-declaration declaration in some countries, or it would be manned at the gate in some others, uh, is also an important part of this. And what's the protocol to follow if somebody is unwell or somebody raises, uh, has a higher temperature? So that's the first part of the question. Of course, the basic sanitation of hand washers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, th those, those are pr pretty much commonsensical. The second part of the second question was about... Um, uh, well, from office, yeah, so I think the commercial, it is, uh, the surveys are telling, uh, telling uh, public surveys right now tell us that a lot of organizations have declared either for safety reasons or because they feel that it is uh, quite okay to work from home. If I remember, I have seen news of TCS uh, in forces. Uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, it's CL Technology recently. Uh, Twitter yesterday, they are all talking about extending or you know, continuing work from home till further notice. And what does it mean if it were to work on a more semi-permanent basis? It is a reduction of commercial real estate, which is what I shared in places like London, Tokyo, Mumbai. It's very expensive for organizations to have very large offices. So you can really cut down on the offices and it's a win-win situation because if you see productivity going up, employee well-being going up, costs going down, who is actually complaining? So this would actually mean that uh, there won't be so much of a headcount cut because you're just, you know, sort of putting people in uh, various workspaces. 
So, and if productivity mm-hmm. is in fact growing up, uh, then we should actually not be uh, thinking of more job cuts. Am I being more uh, think, optimistic? Here? I, this is the two buckets are very different. One is an OPEX cut, another is a CAPEX cut. So, if you're looking at the workforce, it is your operating expenses. And uh, whether it's a marketing expense, whether it is a people expense, whether it is uh, you know, channel expense, many of the expenses are OPEX expenses, not a CAPEX expense. CAPEX expense has long cycle time and OPEX is more immediate. So again, going back to the discussion, depending on the industry you're in, based on the geography you're in, you would be taking a call whether you are focusing on CAPEX or OPEX. Sure. Okay, so the next question comes from T.S. Vasu. And uh, Rajesh, if you could take this. And it's a very interesting question. He says from anthrax to SARS to bird flu to swine, Ebola, etc. and now COVID, whether Lenovo or PVM, do they have plans to have a vertical that keeps sending alerts to other markets or country to minimize the effect of such pandemic? He's basically saying government is not doing a good job. So whether the organizations can come together and, you know, sort of tell people. Sorry, just to understand the question, is it organizations come together or within the organization? He's saying that keeps sending alerts to other markets or countries within your organizations. So if you, I mean, you, you're headquartered out of Amsterdam, so right, that, right, that right. Sort, of, sort of gives you all these things. So within the company. Yeah, the yeah company. okay, got it. Yeah, yeah so, uh, I mean, that's, that's a good question. And uh, to me, I'm not very sure whether you need a separate vertical to do that. Uh, because, uh, again, in these days of optimizing resources, I, I don't know whether that's a good idea to create a new vertical now. But uh, definitely, yes, I think uh, sharing of information and sharing of information in a timely and a transparent manner is absolutely critical. So... I mean, if I were to talk about our company, we have a global team, uh, which meets at a certain frequency. We have a regional team and we have a local uh, India country team, which meets at a certain frequency. And there is flowing of information both ways, right? From here to there and the other way around. And of course, uh, that's one, which is a very formal way of doing it, where we are able to exchange information. And the second thing, which is the most, uh, in my opinion, a very important part is the informal networks that you have so that you're able to, again, share information and exchange information in terms of what's happening in other places, whether you could quickly learn from that. For example, even as things were happening in Italy and Spain, we made sure that we reached out to the colleagues there to understand a little bit about what is going to come up so that uh, to whatever extent possible, and there are some things which are common, uh, we could uh, at least preempt them and address them proactively so that we are able to deal with them better. Yeah. And also, I think uh, from an industry perspective, also, if we are in the same industry, if people can also share. I mean, right now it's a world of collaboration. Uh, so yeah. if we can do that also, I think it'll be good if we can use industry bodies like CII or FICI, etc. to come Again, together uh, and share. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing that point up. Again, here I would say two things. One is, I think uh, bodies like FICI and CII have been doing a great job where, you know, literally we have weekly calls happening on what other companies are facing and how we could address some of these issues together because the issues are pretty much common. So definitely these bodies play a good role. And to top it also, for example, a few of us CEOs have our own informal WhatsApp groups and stuff where we again exchange information <clears throat> so that we are able to, again, address the issues in a, in a timely manner and learn from each other rather than reinvent the wheel all over again. Sure, sure. So the next question is uh, also interesting. It's on innovation. And Subhankar, I would want you to take this. Uh, Anuradha is saying that, you know, though we are innovating and she's given an example saying that we go to the doctor or we're doing, uh, you know, a consultation uh, virtually, but what is the quality check on it? How is the effectiveness? For example, she says, how do we ensure a correct diagnosis if the x-ray centers are uh, closed due to doc- lockdown or if you're going and meeting, consulting, meeting a doctor virtually, how, how, how do we ensure the effectiveness of it? So, well, I'm not a a qualified doctor to be a very uh, medical answer to this, but uh, you know, uh, a physical check of the doctor can never replace uh, virtual. But you know, having said that, telemedicine is not new. Telemedicine has been there for the last one decade. What COVID has really done is it has helped to probably make it a lot more popular. And what choices do you have today? If you do not have the uh, opportunity to go to a doctor where the, the risk of infection to going to a hospital is much higher, or if you don't have doctors available, you have something is better than nothing, number one. Number two, the doctor partnership network that we work in some of the markets are absolutely qualified because we have the full information about the profile of the doctors, background of the organization, and ensure that we have the checks and balances in place. Number three, 
it all depends on the severity of the disease if you have a small ailment of a uh, skin hair you know backache there could pain it could be a very different ball game rather than if it's something more serious of course you need to go to a physical hospital so the whole process is about helping employees alleviating the concern and ensuring give them whatever possible you know in the current situation we are in yeah okay so uh, another question also i would want you to take that it's from vinay uh, he says what are a couple of continuing financial long term impacts that will stay as part of the post covid 19 world for employers as well as for the employees sorry what are the on, continuing financial long term impacts okay not sure what uh, that particularly means uh, but a few implications uh, at least i can talk about is obviously um one is uh, uh, there will be greater scrutiny of uh, any capital expenditure that we would want to make right so uh, there would be a really hard look at some of those before we make some of those uh, capex calls definitely the second is uh, around how can we sweat our assets better so if we already have certain assets with us uh, in our factories etc how can we make the productivity go up how can we improve the efficiency of them so that we can make them sweat better so that we don't need to again link to the same capex point uh the third is um, i think finding ways of uh, again somebody talked about it but reskilling retooling people so that as things progress uh, going forward we are able to be that much more agile and adaptable for the resources that we have to do the slightly different things that we need to do in order to get uh, get going forward so i, I would say these would be a few of the things that uh, organizations would look at uh, as we go forward sure i just want to add something else and we haven't touched up on this topic and because the name of the company we are posting as beyond diversity there's an implication on the gender diversity on covid i think interestingly what's also happening in the diversity front is with more and more organization encouraging work from home we would see resurgence of more women coming back to the workforce who have otherwise probably not had an opportunity to do that because of the either the time they have to travel or they have to juggle work and life uh, in in a pre covid era so markets in asia pacific which have a predominantly lower gender uh, female gender population we hope to see a more number of women coming back to the workforce yeah i i think that's good news um, um not, not just gender i think also with people with a uh, disability etc i think there there is a lot of opportunity there as well because uh, you know you can actually use um, you know and you know you can use your home environment and also still be productive depending on what kind of skill that you have so similarly there's one question from uh, himanshu who says that organization resources now shall be remonitored optimized and projections made of future capacity requirements so what baselines need to take on priority while revising capacity what sorry what baselines what baselines need to take do we need to take on on priority while revising capacity you you mean capacity of uh, production product uh, production as well as headcount i think in terms of uh, uh, for future capacity requirements so what do we want to take on headcount yeah i think i can yeah capacity? i think if it's uh, related to this is something we are very closely involved in so it all depends on the market uh, you know what's really the market outlook do we know the market out no honestly we do not know the market out beyond two quarters we go by idc to some extent we also look at some of the other market research uh, data but idc was pre covid now with covid i think the situation on the ground has changed uh, but number one would be based on your market outlook we have to work backwards and see what's my expense structure and what's my affordability to the question that's being asked and then how do you optimize your resources but as uh, rajesh already mentioned that uh, frugality and innovation are the two themes that are many organizations would be focusing on uh, keeping and technology of course and keeping that in mind one has to look at what's your uh, outlook and resource planning for long term but for the next two quarters i think that's more visible and it would depend on the industry that you are in you are there are some you know expense optimized resources being done uh, based on the industry that you are in and that is because they have an outlook for maybe 3 to 6 months if you look at some of the hospitality stocks like the in, in india if you look at lemon tree or indian hotels actually the the prices are down by 70 to 80% and that's because it may take so much of time for 
some of the hotels to be back to the normal and get the revenue back. But if you look at some of the other industries like consumer staples or to as an example where Rajesh uh, belongs to, that would be less impacted. And I think they would have a much better visibility of a mid to long term outlook. Okay. So I'll take one final question. I know we are three minutes post five. So uh, the, I know it talks about what are the skills uh, that will be useful for employees in the future? Uh, who would want to take that? No, I mean, uh, I can talk about a couple of them and Shubhakar, you could add. I, I, like I said, one definitely is, um, I would say, situational adaptability. You know, how am I able to be agile, uh, nimble-footed and adjust to what is uh, going on around me? I think definitely uh, that becomes a very important skill. Uh, innovation, uh, again, we spoke about it, but innovation not just from a product point of view, but from a whole uh, business model point of view uh, becomes important. Um, and I also noticed there was a couple of, uh, there was an uh, added question on what are some of the things that a CXOs could look at. Uh, I would say, you know, things like vulnerability, uh, empathy, uh, those become important because, you know, it's important for leaders to listen uh, to what's going on in the organization, be empathetic to what's happening, be vulnerable enough to say that they don't know how things are going to pan out. You know, in some of these cases, it's impossible to predict how things will go. And then... You leverage your other skills like situational adaptability, innovation, etc. combined with these to then figure out your way and chart a new course along. So I think some of these uh, so-called softer skills come to the fore uh, during these times. But Subankar probably can add more to it. No, I think you pretty much summed it in a way. I just want to add that even our um, learning uni global virtual learning university has also stepped up. There yeah. are a keen number of free courses being offered by best of the business and the technical schools. So it's a golden opportunity for a lot of employees to reskill themselves if they need to. So uh, unlearning, learning and relearning has always been a lifelong journey. And this gets further accelerated in a crisis like this. Yeah. So uh, thank you both. I just want to just do a quick uh, question so that we all, you know, sort of do a rapid round and then we close. Uh, uh, so you just have to give me one word and I'll just take those 10 questions very quickly. So uh, COVID uncertainty, how long in months? What are you looking? September, December? Give me one, one, one word each. Rajesh? December. Subhankar? Um, six months. Six. Six months. So December again? Yeah. Vaccination availability? Quarter one. Quarter one, 20, 21? Two years for me. Two years. Okay. That's, that's not, that's not good. Okay. Work from home or the new normal work from home or work from office. A mix. Somewhere in between. Mix. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Video calls or in-person meetings. Prefer in-person meetings, but reality is likely to be again a mix. So mix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A new building or sites or investment in technology. Technology, of course. No brainer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, performance appraisal, whether it will be periodic or annual? Um, even before COVID, it has been as frequent as possible. Okay. So if COVID has on. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Continuous. Okay. Mobile learning or classroom learning? Always mobile learning. Virtual learning. Yeah. yeah. Virtual learning. So you're saying that people don't like coming into classrooms? No, it's actually it never, it's never black and white here. So it's all again, it's somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, hiring more or hiring less? <laughs> hiring right. Hiring right. <laughs> <laughs> so Bunker? Uh, based on need. Based on need. Okay. Gig workers or full-time workers? We didn't touch upon this topic. This is another interesting one. I know. So I'll get you back just to yeah. talk about that. So shift, uh -huh. Yeah, I think shift and gig. Shift to, shift, no, shift towards gig is certainly something that one would look at. Yeah. Okay. And the last question, one word to survive and thrive in this world. Adapt. Be optimistic. Okay. Great. So uh, I, I think uh, this was a great session. I know there are a lot of questions, but you know, uh, we will, uh, you know, I, I, I will, you know, sort of see if we can, you know, sort of put it together and, uh, you know, sort of take it back to our uh, people who have joined in. Uh, but thank you so much, Rajesh and Subhankar. We are already five minutes beyond time and uh, it, was, it was really nice. 
uh, for you all to candidly share uh, uh, your, uh, you know, the decision making which is happening. And I, I think it will be a very, very different world once we get back to uh, physical work, uh, when we get back uh, into office. So I just want to, before I close, I just want to talk about uh, uh, the mentor and mentee program, the pro bono mentor and mentee program that we had announced in the COVID thing. And it was a great success. We have already sort of uh, uh, done about 40 to 50 uh, mentor me uh, mentee matching. And it was a pro bono exercise and it was really nice. Um, so we are now actually taking it forward and we will be announcing soon our iLeap Leadership Accelerator program. Uh, which uh, is what we are basically known for. So this is unfortunately only for women, uh, but, uh, you know, do consider and do look out uh, for, you know, sort of we will be doing this in a completely virtual mobile uh, learning way instead of the physical learning uh, mentoring program that we were doing. And um, the next uh, inspiring Thursday webinar is next week uh, with uh, Zarina Stanford, who is the chief marketing officer for Cinity. She used to be the chief marketing officer for uh, SAP, uh, 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 till about recently. And uh, since she will be coming uh, talking to us from Austin in the US, uh, the timing is going to be 7.30 instead of the usual four o'clock. So I would request all of you to join in for this particular uh, webinar as well. So thank you everybody. And uh, I look forward to, you know, sort of being in touch with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Shubankar. Bye. Thanks Rashmi. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, uh, Shubankar. Sure.